Let's proceed to the main exhibit hall and look at some of the actual vehicles that have played a prominent role in speeding up mail delivery. Consider how long it used to take to send a letter across a relatively short distance. Back in the 1600s, it took two weeks on horseback to get a letter from Boston to New York, a distance of about 260 miles. Crossing a river was also a challenge. Ferry service was so irregular that a carrier would sometimes wait hours just to catch a ferry. For journeys inland, there was always the stagecoach, but the ride was by no means comfortable because it had to be shared with other passengers. The post office was pretty ingenious about some routes. In the 19th century, in the southwestern desert, for instance, camels were brought in to help get the mail through. In Alaska, reindeer were used. This practice was discontinued because of the disagreeable temperament of these animals. We'll stop here a minute so that you can enter this replica of a railway mail car. It was during the age of the iron horse that delivery really started to pick up. In fact, the United States transported most bulk mail by train for nearly 100 years. The first air mail service didn't start until 1918. Please take a few moments to look around. I hope you'll enjoy your tour. And as you continue on your own, may I suggest you visit our impressive philatelic collection. Not only can you look at some of the more unusual stamps issued, but there's an interesting exhibit on how stamps are made. So, you see, physical illness can have psychological causes. Now, we just have time to introduce another interesting example of the interaction between the mind and the body. Placebos. Placebos, maybe you've heard them called sugar pills, are harmless substances, not always sugar, that are used routinely on groups of sick people in experiments. These experiments test the effectiveness of new drugs. One group is given the new drug, the other group is given a placebo, and the results are measured. As you might guess, some of the people who receive the new drug get better. Surprisingly, however, some of the placebo group also get better. Why? Well, it's an interesting question, one which doctors can't quite answer. Some of the group may have gotten better on their own without any treatment at all. But research has shown that the very act of taking a medication that you think will make you better often does make you feel better. Have you ever taken an aspirin and felt better in five minutes? Aspirin doesn't work that fast, does it? Basically, if you believe you will get better, sometimes you do. The history of how doctors and healers have used the mind-body connection to cure people is long and interesting. But I see that it's time to close, so I'll have to cover this in the next class. You'll have to hold your questions on this topic till then. Before you go, I have some handouts for you concerning the midterm exams next week. So, uh, as Jim said, James Polk was the 11th president, and, uh, well, my report's about the next president, Zachary Taylor. Taylor was elected in 1849. It's surprising because, well, he was the first president that didn't have any previous political experience. The main reason he was chosen as a candidate was because he was a war hero. In the army, his men called him old, rough, and ready, I guess because of his rough edges, he was kind of blunt, and he didn't really look like a military hero. He liked to do things like wear civilian clothes instead of a uniform, even in battle. And he was so short and plump, he had to be lifted up onto his horse. But he did win a lot of battles, and he became more and more popular. 
So the Whig Party decided to nominate him for the presidency, even though no one knew anything about where he stood on the issues. I couldn't find much about his accomplishments, probably because he was only in office about a year and a half before he died. But one thing, he pushed for the development of the Transcontinental Railroad because he thought it was important to form a link with the West Coast. There was a lot of wealth in California and Oregon from commerce and minerals and stuff. Also, he established an agricultural bureau in the Department of the Interior and promoted more government aid to agriculture. Well, that's about all I found. Like I said, he died in office in 1850, so his vice president took over. And that's the next report. So, thank you. As Dr. Miller mentioned, we're trying to recruit volunteers for the Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. But before I get into the details of the volunteer program, I'd just like to tell you a little about what we do there. One of our main jobs is to keep detailed records of the migration patterns of raptors. For those of you who don't know, raptors are birds of prey, like hawks and eagles. Between August and December, we see around 20 different species migrating from Canada and New England. About 20,000 birds. Part of what attracts them to Hawk Mountain is the location on the east ridge of the Appalachian Mountains. What happens is that the sun warms the ridge in such a way that air currents are formed. The birds just sort of glide along on the air, so they use up very little energy. As volunteers, you'll be helping us keep accurate counts of the raptors. Any drop in number could mean something's gone wrong in the environment because of pesticides or disease, even hunting. We just had a scare with the broad-winged hawks. Their numbers have dropped drastically over the last 10 years. It was suggested that the birds may have changed their migratory route. So for 11 days, we had several hundred volunteers stationed every five miles to observe and count. And sure enough, they discovered that instead of hugging the Appalachians as they'd always done, the broad wings were cutting a wider path over the Delaware River. Needless to say, we were greatly relieved. At last month's meeting, you asked me to draw up a report about the possibility of keeping the student center open 24 hours a day. I decided that the best way to assess the need for expanded hours was to talk to the people who were still in the student center at closing time. First, over the course of the two weeks, I interviewed more than 50 students as they left the student center at its regular closing time of 12 midnight. About 80% of them said they would prefer that the center stay open later. Of the three main uses of the center, eating in the snack bar, recreation in the game room or watching TV, and studying, by far the most popular late-night activity is, and this may surprise you, studying. Almost all of the people I talked to said that their main reason for being in the center after 10 p.m. was to study in groups or to find a quiet place to study because their dorm was too noisy. Of course, many of these people use the snack bar or TV room for breaks. My recommendation is that we ask the administration to keep the center open after midnight for studying. The recreation room and snack bar can still close at the usual time. This should meet the objection that it costs too much to staff the center from midnight to 8 a.m., which I'm sure will be the first response.
One reason oceanographers analyze the sediment on the ocean floor is to see how long-term changes in Earth's temperature have affected the depth of the ocean. By analyzing the remains of sea animals in old layers of ocean sediment, oceanographers can determine the depth of the ocean in the past. They've analyzed hundreds of such layers, including some from the coldest periods of Earth's history, the Ice Ages. What they found is that during the Ice Ages, the amount of water in the oceans decreased. Water levels in the ocean dropped by about 400 feet. Water from the ocean evaporated and became frozen in continental glaciers, so it didn't drain back into the ocean. When temperatures eventually rose again, the glaciers melted and the oceans returned to their former depths. Analysis of sedimentary data indicates that periods of glacial freezing and melting occurred in regular cycles of 20,000, 40,000, and 100,000 years. Oceanographers are interested in the history of seawater levels because they hope to use this historical data in order to predict the possible effect that global warming could have on seawater levels. If industrial pollutants are capable of heating global temperatures to the point that glaciers begin to melt, it is urgent for us to know precisely how high sea levels will rise as a result. That's an interesting question, Tom. Women did participate in the early days of motion picture making. One of the most outstanding is Lois Weber. She is credited as the first consistently successful woman film director. In the early 1900s, when she first arrived in Hollywood, Ms. Weber made a series of experimental sound films. Now, this was almost 20 years before modern talking pictures were developed. The dialogue for her movies was recorded on phonograph records and then synchronized with the action on the movie screen. Very innovative for that time. In addition, Weber felt that movies should be educational as well as entertaining. She made several highly controversial movies that dealt with the moral and social issues of her day. And some of her most controversial work addressed issues of particular interest to women. Unfortunately, Weber died in 1939, just as Hollywood was beginning to make films aimed primarily at female audiences. Which brings me to my next point. 